بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم Welcome to week three of the Sahih al-Bukhari seminar. Inshallah, we continue. And we're exactly halfway through the class, and we're in the second half. There's a lot more to cover, and we're going to try our best to finish the entire first book, first uh, kitab, uh, or bab, Badul Wahi, depending on your manuscript. And there's a lot to cover about Sahih al-Bukhari itself. So let's begin with a little bit of biography. So today we want to look at, and this is an extensive section, we can do as much as we, as time allows, what his teacher said about him, rahimahullah ta'ala. So the teachers of, of any great person tells, um, tell a lot about who that person was, because we are in, to a large extent, the products of our teachers. Um, but there are always students that surpass their teachers, but the base is always coming from higher up. And that is the Islamic tradition. Everything we receive comes from teachers, from teachers going back to the source. So Imam al-Bukhari, he had like so many teachers. He had 1,080 teachers, according to Ibn Hajar. And as I mentioned, as we alluded to in his biography, um, everywhere he went, people recognized that he was special. And his teachers began to recognize him, and his teachers praised him immensely. So Ibn al-Hajar in Huda Sari, he has a whole section on outlining what his teachers said about him. And that's something amazing. If your teacher can say something about you, um, that's far better than anyone else who can praise you. Of course, we don't look for praise, but this is just gives you an, an idea of who Imam al-Bukhari was. So Suleiman ibn Harb, one day he looked at him in class and he said, Hada yakunu lahu seat. This one is going to be famous. So teachers have this premonition. They can tell, you know, some students when they have a special talent, they can sell, tell that some individuals are going places. Um, Bukhari also says Suleiman, the same Suleiman ibn Harb, he said, I used to attend his classes. Kuntu idha dakhaltu ala Suleiman ibn Harb, yaqulu bayin lana ghalt shu'ba. When I used to attend the classes of Suleiman, he used to ask me to point out all the mistakes of the narrations of shu'ba. So, you know, even the teachers are relying on him for his expertise. Abu Mus'ab al-Zuhri, that's not Zuhri Imam Malik's teacher, but a different one. He said, Bukhari is more knowledgeable in fiqh and hadith than Imam Ahmad in our eyes. So even Imam Ahmad is one generation prior to Imam Bukhari, among the teachers of Bukhari as well. But he was so high up, Bukhari only met him. He wasn't a real teacher of his. He was a teacher, but he, he didn't sit down and learn hadith from him. So Imam Ahmad and Bukhari have a connection. So they used to review hadith with mudhakara. Like uh, when they met each other, they would just review hadith, but Bukhari never had the chance to sit in the circles of Imam Ahmad um, and learn hadith from him. Because of that, there is not a single hadith in the Sahih that he narrates from Imam Ahmad. Although he reviewed hundreds of hadith, or thousands of hadith with him. <clears throat> anyway, someone compared him and said he's even far better in the knowledge of fiqh and hadith than Imam Ahmad in our eyes. So when this scholar said that, someone objected and said, you have crossed the limits. How dare you say something like that? Um, and he said, had you lived in the time of Malik and looked upon his face in the face of Muhammad ibn Ismail, you would have seen that the two of them are the same in hadith and fiqh. So he went further. He said, okay, you think the, the, the comment about Imam Ahmad is outlandish? If Bukhari was alive in the time of Imam Malik, you would have looked at both of them, you would have said they are the same. So he said even he's, he's similar to Imam Malik in stature. Uh, Abdan ibn Uthman al-Marwazi, he said while pointing to Bukhari, I have not seen with my eyes any young person as perceptive as this one. So, so many people comment on the idea, the fact that 
what they found in Bukhari was unique. And they found no one else matching him. Abu Asim, so Muhammad ibn Qutayba was attending the class of Abu Asim and Nabil uh, when he, when this, when Bukhari attended the class as well, and he was very young at that time, pre-teen. And he was a young boy, <clears throat> and they asked him, who is this person? And they said, Muhammad ibn Ismail. So this teacher, Abu Asim and Nabil, great teacher, he says, Hadha al-ghulam yunatihu al-kabbash. So he said, this is a boy that can butt rams. So a butting ram, a battering ram, you know, like you have now in cars, battering rams with trucks. But in that time, you had these goats that had the horns, and they would destroy, like they would butt their rams against, and they would just demolish their opposition. It's a metaphor for, you know, he, he will overtake everything. Qutayba ibn Sa'id, he says, I accompanied many jurists, many ascetics, and many, worship, many worshippers, like Zuhad and Fuqaha and Urbad, people who worshipped Allah. But I have never seen in my conscious memory the likes of Muhammad ibn Ismail, where he was like, and this is what he said, Jalastul Fuqaha was Zuhad wal Urbad, Fama ra'aytu mundu aqalt, mithlu Muhammad ibn Ismail, wa huwa fi zamanihi. Ka'umar fi Sahaba. He was <clears throat> in his time, Bukhari among his peers was like Umar ibn al Khattab among the companions. Just how preeminent he was above his entire generation. And then he also said, Lokana Muhammad ibn Ismail fi Sahaba lakana aya. Even if he had lived among the companions, he would have been a sign of Allah Azza wa Jal. Qutayba once asked a question when Muhammad ibn Ismail walked in. <clears throat> And he said to his audience, this person is Imam Ahmad, Ishaq ibn Rahaway, and Ali ibn al-Madini, all in one, whom Allah has brought to you. Meaning you're asking me the question, here's a man who combines Imam Ahmad, Ishaq, and Ali ibn al-Madini, pointed to Bukhari. هذا أحمد ibn Hanbal, wa Ishaq ibn Rahaway, wa Ali ibn al-Madini, qad saqahum Allahu ilayk. Um, he also used to say, people have traveled to me from the east and west, but have never seen his light. Um, this man, statement was mentioned to Mihyar al-Basri, another scholar. He said, Qutayba has spoken the truth. For I have seen, with the, um, before I have seen Yahya ibn Ma'in and Ahmad ibn Hanban, they both relied on Bukhari and preferred his insight and understanding. Ibrahim ibn Muhammad ibn Salam, he said, the great leaders of the field of hadith used to prefer the understanding and insight of Bukhari over themselves. And he mentioned many great names. So people, when they recognize his stature, then they would prefer his opinions. They would reach out to him. They would ask his opinion. They would just accept his opinions. Um, Bundar, whose name was Muhammad ibn Bashar, he said, he was the most knowledgeable human being of his time. <laughs> and he used to be very, very proud of him. He was a teacher. All these people are teachers of Bukhari. They're not students. They're not peers. They're not people who read his books. They're teachers. So he said, <laughs> And he said, I've been so proud of him for many, many years. And Muhammad ibn Salam al-Baykandi, he said, uh, he used to say the same thing. And someone said to him, who's this boy you keep talking to? He said, This is the one who has no peer, someone who has no, no one like him. And he also used to say, this teacher, Muhammad ibn Salam al-Baykandi, he said, every time Bukhari attended my classes, my circles, I would be terrified. And the fear never left me until he left. Because now when teachers realize, here's a student, that probably knows more than them, and he can keep them on their toes. That's something actually very frightening for a teacher, very stressful for a teacher. Stressful is the right word. <clears throat> Ibn Hajar says, Kullama dakhala alayya. Uh, no, Ibn Hajar explains that what he means is that it's the fear of making a mistake in his uh, presence. And then he used to tell another student, another student related that this teacher told him, if you were here earlier, I could have showed you a boy that has memorized 70,000 hadith. Bukhari was 18 years old when he visited his first teacher. Not his first teacher, but the first teacher in the Sahih, who is who? Who is the very first teacher in the Sahih that we mentioned in the Isnad? 
Hromedi, yeah. So he said he visited Hromedi when he was 18 years old, and he was having a hadith dispute with someone. I mean, Hromedi, he was arguing with someone about a hadith, and he said, when Bukhari came, Ja'a man yufassil baynana. He said, now here is someone who just came, he can settle this for us. And he asked Bukhari to judge between them, and they accepted his judgment on the hadith. Ishaq ibn Rahawai, a great scholar, was once speaking on the mimbar while Bukhari was sitting. And Bukhari corrected a hadith reference. And then, so he's on the mimbar teaching hadith, and Bukhari corrected him on a hadith reference. And <clears throat> what did he do? What did he say? Well, what would you imagine he would say? Um, some people might get annoyed. Some teachers might double down, and there's known to happen. Um, but this is what he said to his students. He said, Ya Ashab al Hadith, Ya Ma'ashar Ashab al Hadith, Unduru ila hadha shab, waktubu anhu, fa innahu lo kana fi zaman il Hassan ibn Abil Hassan al Basri, lahtaju ilay. He said, O oh, people of Hadith, man, this is Ishaq ibn Rahaway, great expert of Hadith of his generation. Of his generation, he's, he's among the five top experts of Hadith. And this is the generation of, of Ahmad ibn Hanbal and those before him. He said, oh, people of Hadith, and he's on the member teaching Hadith, and Bukhari, a young boy, corrected him. He said, oh, people of Hadith, pay attention to this boy, learn from him, write the, his Hadith down. Because if he was alive in the era of Hassan al-Basri himself, one of the best of the Tabi'een, he said, he would even rely on him. So this is Ishaq ibn Rahway. These aren't small names. There are many individuals that said things about Bukhari, but Ibn Hajar selects the experts, the major people in the field. When they're saying things like this, you know, there's something is very special about him. <clears throat> so once he took, and we're still talking about Ishaq ibn Rahaway, once he took Bukhari's book on narrators, at tarikh which he wrote in Medina, to a prince, Abdullah ibn Tahir, and he said, Ya ayyuhal amir, uh, should I show you some magic? So he called this book magic. This is absolutely amazing what Bukhari did with this book. So this is, these are the words that people use in his lifetime and how people used to talk about him among each other, especially among the generation of his, of his teachers. And even Ishaq even once said to some of his students in the presence of Bukhari, he is more knowledgeable than me. Can you imagine like one or two generations prior to him? And they're not like peers. They're not like at the same age. Bukhari is very, very young. His Haqib and Rahaway is very, very old. And he manages to meet him and, and become a student. And Ali ibn al-Madini, one of his favorite teachers, um, when he used to sit in his class, and Bukhari learned a lot from him. Much of his hadith criticism and expertise and critique comes from Ali ibn al-Madini. So Ali ibn al-Madini is one of his favorite teachers, and Bukhari used to sit on his right. And whenever... Uh, Ali used to speak, he would turn to Bukhari out of respect. And, and this is a teacher that Bukhari himself, Bukhari was never intimidated by anybody. Everywhere he went, he, he corrected his teachers. But he said there's only one person. He said, nafsi ahadin illa inda Ali ibn al-Madini. Bukhari says, I have never considered myself or felt myself inferior in front of any human being except in the presence of Ali ibn al-Madini. So Ali ibn al-Madini was one of his favorite teachers. This is what Bukhari says about him. And someone told Ali later, Bukhari said this about you. What did he say? He said, Da'a nafsahu. He said, ignore this statement of his, leave this statement of his, because he's a person who has never seen someone even of his own equal, his parallel, let alone someone who is higher than him. So I'll continue tomorrow, but that gives you a glimpse. There's so many more uh, teachers that have said things about him, but it's, you know, when you look at the greatest teachers of his time or the greatest people of the generation above him, these are the things that they're saying about Imam al-Bukhari, rahimahullahu ta'ala. Okay, any questions? So now we want to move on. There's a topic we need to discuss, which is the teachers of Imam al-Bukhari. 
um, now an academic of not the what the teacher said about him, but the teachers themselves. Who are the teachers of Imam al Bukhari? So I'll share with you one um, stat from Ibn al Hajar. How many teachers did Bukhari have in hadith? How many teachers did he relate hadith from? Well, Park figure, anyone know? Good guess. Anyone else? So it's Sahih Bukhari, huh? Like, um, he. I mean, he had, how many hadith did he have? He had hundreds of thousands, 600,000 hadith he memorized. 18? No, no, he would have, like, yeah, that's, that's a lot closer. So it was, there's actually 1,080 teachers he took hadith from. So he had 1,080 teachers in hadith. Okay. Yeah, but I'm asking you how many teachers he had. Yeah, so I said, how many teachers did he take hadith from? So he took hadith from 1,080 teachers. So Ibn Hajar has good research in his Huda Sari. And to learn Bukhari and to learn hadith sciences, <clears throat> as we're mentioning isnads, right? So far, we're in hadith number three or four. So every isnad comes from a teacher of Bukhari. And we learned a lot about his first teacher, Humaydi, learning who's who and these connections. They're very, very important. These connections are what teach you, um, give you history and teach you who's who and who's getting information from who. So Imam al-Bukhari, um, he had teachers in five tiers. So in terms of ranking. So Ibn Hajar classifies his teachers so, well, first of all, Imam Bukhari said himself, "Katabtu an alf wa thamanina nafsan laysa fihim illa sahib hadith." It's a great statement. It tells you a lot. So Bukhari himself said, "Katabtu an alfi wa thamanina nafsan." So this is his admission. I wrote hadith from one thousand and eighty individuals. Laysa fihim illa sahib hadithin. And every single one of them was a person of hadith, a scholar of hadith. Some were better scholars than, than others, but every single one of them was a teacher and, and a scholar of hadith. What does that tell you? It tells you Bukhari was so careful. Um, it tells you a number of things. One, it tells you that he wanted, he, he, he wanted to get knowledge from everywhere. He traveled extensively in his jami'ah. He collected hadith from so many teachers. He didn't want to leave anything out. So there's this comprehensive nature, uh, element in his studies, in his research, in his learning. So 1,080 teachers, no small task. This is writing hadith from them. The total number of teachers he had is probably more than that. So there are teachers that he learned Arabic from, they learned Quran from, and he didn't necessarily write hadith from. There are people you learn from, you're not necessarily writing down like, so you see them, you learn something from them, you benefit from them in some way. But people of hadith um, that he wrote from 1080. So, and so he was looking for the experts of hadith. And that's a theme I shared with you. Like we looked at the isnad. Bukhari is not just looking for random people to learn hadith from. Whereas isnads, he's looking for the best. He's looking for the top teachers and he's looking for the top students of each teacher. So Ibn Hajar analyzes his teachers and he says there are five tiers, okay, and, and this is important. The first tier are the individuals. Let me find my slide. The students of the Tabi'in. So generation three. So generation one, if you call that the Sahaba. Generation two are the Tabi'in. Generation three are the students of the Tabi'in, the students of the successors. So Bukhari actually had many teachers who were from generation three. So the first three generations, what's special about them? What do we call that generation? Somebody said it? I can't hear that loud because the AC. Salaf, yeah. So this is the golden generation. There are many adjectives to describe it. Why, why are they special? Why, is, why are three generations special? And it could be more than that, but primarily everyone agrees these three generations are quite special. They have like a, 
there is a authority to the, these three generations. What is the reason for that? Yeah, so what did he say? Exactly. The Prophet Sallallahu said, Khairukum Qarni Thumma Ladina Yalunahum Thumma Ladina Yalunahum. He said, The best of you are my generation, and who's his generation? Sahaba. Thumma Ladina Yalunahum, and then those that followed him, them. Thumma Ladina, you know, that's the Tabi'een. And then he said, Those who followed them. So these three generations generation one, two, and three. So Bukhari managed to get teachers from the golden generation, from the Salaf. Many of his teachers are part of the Salaf. So he narrates from many, many individuals. Um, the bulk of these teachers are among, there's a group of, there are 22 hadith that are called the Thulathiyat hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari. I'm going to do a small session on that in more detail, but just for your purposes at this point, there are 22 hadith in Sahih Bukhari that has between Bukhari and the Prophet Sallallahu only three people. So the companion, a tabari, and the follower of the tabari, and then Bukhari. So Bukhari managed to link to the Prophet Sallallahu with only three generations between him. That's the highest chain he has. Many isnas in Bukhari have seven or eight or other numbers. But three is the highest chain in Bukhari, and he managed to get 22 hadith like that. They're called Thulathiyat al-Bukhari. Thulathiyat is, means trilateral from the word Thalatha, meaning three. So most of these teachers, that they're part of those narrations, and, and their entire like sessions, scholars look at just the Thulathiyat. They read the 22 hadith. That's a great uh, endeavor project to memorize or learn these 22 hadith. With Isnad, because Isnad would not be that long. It would be Bukhari, from Atbar Tabari, from a Tabari, from a Sahabi, and from the Prophet. So that's the first tier. That's the highest the, of his teachers. Second tier would be the students of those. Or actually, they would be from the same generation, but they're contemporaries of that first tier, but they did not narrate from major followers. So, you know, every generation you have experts, you have the four look for the pioneers of that generation, and you have people that follow. So there are a number of people that are, belong to this generation. So they managed to see a Tabari. So they're part of this generation, but they didn't really relate from major Tabarin. They didn't relate from Abu Asim and Nabi. They didn't relate from Sa'id ibn Musayyib or Hassan al-Basri, but they related from minor figures. So if you want to know examples, um, Adam bin... This is not important. I just want you to know the concepts. Ibn Hajar lists Adam ibn Abi Iyas among the teachers that belong to uh, tier two. Abu Mi'ashar, Abdul A'la ibn Mi'ashar, Sa'id ibn Abi Maryam, and Ayyub ibn Suleiman ibn Bilal. So we're classifying them in terms of rank. Okay, so that's his second tier of teachers. The third tier of teachers is the majority of his teachers, which would be the middle tier. So Imam al-Bukhari calls them the middle tier. So these were people who did not meet any Tabari. So they're not from generation three. But they narrated from the senior scholars of that next generation. So these are great teachers. Like these are teachers like, so who are the teachers in the middle tier? Um, these are great names you'll recognize. Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal. Yahya ibn Ma'in. Ali ibn al-Madini. Ishaq ibn Rahawi. Nu'aym ibn Hamad, Suleiman ibn Harb, who we talked about, and Qutayba ibn Sa'id, who we talked about. So this tier of teacher is also shared by Imam Muslim. So Imam Muslim, so what sets Bukhari apart from the other six, so Imam Muslim is, a, is also highly authentic, but Imam Muslim has none from tier one and none from tier two. But he has many, he shares the teachers of Bukhari from the middle tier. That shows you Bukhari was even higher than Imam Muslim in terms of who he was able to meet and the highness of his knowledge. Uh, ta'ala. So that's the middle tier. The fourth tier are the, those who were the contemporaries of Bukhari, but slightly more senior to him. So they're kind of from his generation, but slightly more senior. So they wouldn't be major teachers of his, but he still learned a lot from them. So he, uh, who are these? 
people like Abu Hatim al Razi. So he's from the generation of Bukhari. So, but he, when Bukhari learned from him, um, Muhammad ibn Yahya Dhuhli and others. So these are people slightly more senior than him, but from his same generation. And finally, the final tier, the fifth tier, and we'll close with that, are those who were younger than Bukhari. So someone of that stature, right? Like someone of Bukhari's stature, why would he learn from someone younger than him? So actually Imam al-Bukhari, the reason he does that, he doesn't need to, because the knowledge he has, he has the teachers of these teachers. Um, but there's a statement of Waqi ibn al-Jarrah, which is very important, and Muhaddithin paid attention to that. That statement is, لا يكون المحدث كاملا حتى يكتب, يكتب عمن هو فوقه وعمن هو مثله وعمن هو دونه. Okay, so it's a great statement. It means a muhaddith, a hadith expert will never be complete until, and you can apply that to any serious student. You can't be a real student, a serious student until you write from those who are above you, meaning you get teachers who are older than you, more senior than you. And you learn from those who are your peers, from your own generation. And you're ready to learn from those who are younger than you. So that's what hadith science is, and that's what knowledge is. If you're afraid, or you're not afraid, if you're, well, if you're afraid to approach older people, that shyness will prevent you from reaching those above you. Um, I think Ibn Abbas said something to that effect. Um, like three people can, will not attain knowledge. One is mustahi, the one who is shy, mustahi. So if you're shy, you have the quality of shyness and you're afraid to reach out, then you'll miss a lot of older teachers. But then if you have, there's another quality that prevents you from getting younger teachers, that is arrogance or ego. Maybe not arrogance is probably a strong word, but ego. So, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of bruises your ego when you're learning from someone who's young. And you see that a lot in communities. You have, you know, a young imam comes on board. He's like maybe 20 years old or 25 years old. And there are people in the community who are 60 and 70 and you might have more knowledge and they have trouble accepting what he says. So this is a great principle, and we'll close with that, Imam al-Bukhari. Because of that principle, he made it a, a point to narrate from people who are younger than him, who are below him. Not a lot, but just for the sake of Barakah. So he has, you have to mention, there would be a number of teachers mentioned in this regard. They give names, you won't know the names, but Abdullah ibn Hamad al-Amili, Abdullah ibn Abi al-As al-Khwarizmi, Hussein ibn Muhammad al-Qabbani and others. Wallahu ta'ala a'la. So any questions? We'll we'll stop here. That's all I wanted to say about his teachers. Yeah. The third one was Hussein ibn Muhammad al-Qabbani. There's two. There, I mean there are two qualities I mentioned, so um but the three are people above you, people equal to you, and people below you. Those three ranks you have to be willing to learn from. Any questions? Okay, let's summarize and then we'll break from Maghrib. So in this slide here, this is a summary of Ibn Hajar's research. Imam al-Bukhari had 1,080 teachers in hadith that he narrated from. From them, he used 321 of them in the Sahih. That means not all his teachers uh, fit that bare level or the minimum criteria he had for inclusion in the Jamia. So he only used 321 of them. So he was selective in which teachers he used for al jamia Sahih. So he used the best of them, those who he was certain about. And out of the 321, this is an interesting stat, <coughs> 20 teachers he used for a majority of the Sahih. More than half of the Sahih comes from only 20 teachers. So, so he's getting even highly more and more selective. So 
there's so much you can learn from that. So he's willing to learn from everyone, but then he's selective in, 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 in using them in the Sahih. And his favorite ones, the ones who are the highest, or he considers the most reliable, are only 20 that he uses for more than 50% of the reports of the Sahih. So that makes it less daunting for us to study. So that means you have to study, you really have to study. If you want to know Bukhari and you want to learn Hadith sciences, there are 20 teachers you need to learn in, in detail, their biography, who they were. And then you'll know most of the teachers or, or most of the reports for the Sahih, where they're coming from. Yeah. They're in what? Yeah, yeah. This is, this is exactly what this means. These are all Isnads. 1080 means he has 1080 Isnads from different teachers. 321, that means all the Isnads in Sahih Bukhari, if you look at just the level above Bukhari, the teachers he's narrating from, there are 321. But more than 50% of the book is coming from 20 of his teachers. So Ibn Hajr lists those 20, and I'll share with you. I'm not going to go through their uh, biographies, but we'll do them because we did every hadith. We're looking at one of his teachers. So maybe by the end of this seminar, the ones that are left over, we'll mention those. So if you have, like, you need to have a running bi uh, biographical notebook, where every scholar you learn about, you need to put key details, something interesting about them, where they lived, when they passed, and who are their major teachers and students. With that, you can really begin to understand the science of Rijal. Wallahu a'lam. So let's take a break here. We're going to go down, pray Maghrib. Online students will resume in exactly 15 minutes or so. Just some quick um, announcements. So brothers are, mashallah, buying books and uh, getting their copies. So um, um, Brother Arfan bought the Dar al edition. He just received it. Uh, so he has it if you want to take a look at it. Um, it's, uh, it's not exactly the same as the one that uh, is on the PDF. So it looks like most of the footnotes are eliminated. But I think uh, we're going to have to investigate easy to read but whether like what they did with it what did they admit from the from the the one that's usually widely referenced and then uh, brother ibrahim bought a couple copies of sahih bukhari the yunini edition this is from dar ibn Kathir. so i just uh, purchased this from him he got extra copies about to return one of them if anyone wants to look at he has the open one right here and then uh before he returns, if you want to get this copy, he has an extra one. We'll bring it to you, or you can take this one. I'll take a yeah. So this is sixty dollars, but it's so the good thing about it. What I like is entire Sahih in one volume. I don't like carrying multiple volumes around. So the whole Sahih Bukhari in one volume, and it's based on the Unini edition. But it doesn't look like it has all the footnotes, like the exhaustive footnotes of the editions. But still, it seems to be a good copy. So we're still searching for the perfect copy. Uh, we haven't found it, but as, as you buy new ones, just bring them to our attention so we can take a look. So. What happened? Yeah, yeah, here. Um, okay. <laughs> The whole class is going to change from a serious class to. But that's good. We need a balance. Just don't come every week. <laughs> okay, Bismillah. So you want to hold on to this because there'll be a lot of questions for the next session. The next session should be very, very interesting. It's. Uh, for me, it's the most interesting part, one of the most interesting parts of Imam al-Bukhari. So he has a number of unlikely teachers. So we always talk about the teacher, they're, you know, great experts and uh, the muhaddithin of their time and so on and so forth. But then he has so many teachers in his, well, not so many, but there he has a fair amount of teachers that kind of break that flow and kind of make you think what is going on so 
and it makes you challenge some of your assumptions on what it is to be like who can you take knowledge from and so on and so forth so let me share with you a number of names number one abad ibn yaqub of kufa who died in the year 250 okay so he was shiari from the shiari sect so he had a teacher at least one teacher actually more than one who was Shiite. So that's quite surprising. Um, so who was this individual? Let me tell you something about him. His name was Abu Sa'id Abad ibn Yaqub. He was a Hadith expert of Kufa who was blind. He was born in the year 150, the same year Abu Hanifa died. And you might be thinking, okay, maybe he's just a moderate Shia. Uh, maybe he's so he was so extreme that he only took Shia students. He wouldn't teach, if you weren't part of his sect, he wouldn't teach them. Um, so here's an interesting story. Al-Qasim and Imam al-Dhahbi chronicles this. Al-Qasim uh, al-Mutarriz, a hadith student, he says, دَخَلْتُ عَلَىٰ عَبَّادِ بِالْكُوفَةِ He came to Kufa to study hadith, and he wanted to learn from Abad, because he had like... Um, he used to teach hadith, and some of his hadith were very valuable, it's not. So he says, So his practice was, he would test his students. To get into his class, he would ask them questions first. So he said, when I went to his class, this is what he asked. He said, Man hafar al -bahar. Who split the, who makes the ocean run? And he said, Qultu Allah. He said, I, I gave him the answer, Allah does. He goes, Hua kadhaak, ulakin man hafarahu. Of course it's Allah, but who makes it flow? The Bahar. And then, um, then he said, I don't know. He said, Hafarahu Ali. Ali bin Abi Talib is the one who's responsible for making the water flow. That was the answer to the first question. It's kind of like a riddle or like a secret code to get into the class. Okay? And then he said, فَمَنْ أَجْرَاهُ When man hafara means who digs the oceans, the ocean beds. Then he said, فَمَنْ أَجْرَاهُ Who makes the water flow? That's the second question. And Al-Qasim said, Allah. He goes, yes, but who makes the water flow? And he said, okay, you tell me who makes it flow. Um, he said, أَجْرَاهُ al Hussein, Hussein, the son of Ali, he is the one who makes the water flow. And then, uh, so these are the questions he used to ask. So then he said, I saw, and he's blind, I saw there was a sword and a shield hanging on his wall. He used to teach hadith, there was a sword and a shield on his wall. So I asked him, Liman hadha, what are these for? He said, A'adattuhu li'uqatila bihi ma'al mahdi. He said, I'm waiting for the mahdi to come back. And these are what I'm going to use to fight in his army. So then, you know, he learned some hadith from him. He sat with him and then he said he wanted to do something else. So he came back the next day. Because he's blind, he doesn't recognize you, right? So he asked the same questions. But now he knows the answers, right? So he asked him the same question the next day. So after, well, maybe not the next day, but after he got his hadith, the hadith that he wanted to get, he learned everything. And then to make a point, he came back. And when he asked him those questions, this is the answer he gave. He said, the one who dug the oceans is Muawiyah, and the one who makes the river flow is Amr ibn al-As. And then, <laughs> then he jumped up, he ran out of that class, and the scholars started screaming, here's the enemy of Allah, go catch him. And people were chasing him, but he ran away. So this is who this person was, uh, Abad ibn Yaqub. So I want you to think now, you have to challenge your thinking. Someone like that, why would you learn from him? Why would anyone take his hadith? Um, I mean, why? He's a liar? No, but why would you take his hadith? Yeah, but if he's untrustworthy, you wouldn't... Like, Bukhari actually relates from him in the Sahih. Bukhari relates from Abad bin Yaqub in, in the Sahih. Sahih al-Bukhari, Kitab al-Tawheed, Bab 
So he relates in there, he says, Haddathani Sulaiman, Haddathana Shu'ba an al Walid, Ha, wa Haddathani Abad ibn Yaqub al Asadi. So Bukhari relates from Abad. Can you believe that? As a secondary, it's not. But his name is there as a teacher. He learned from him. So the fact is, the reason is because he was honest. So he wasn't a liar, he was honest in his reporting. So Al Hakim says, Al Hakim says, I asked Darukutni about Abad bin Yaqub, what's his status? Qal Shi'i Sadduq. He was Shi'i, but he was trustworthy. So he wasn't a liar, but although he belonged to that sect. So that kind of, you know, is, is, can you imagine someone saying that today? Imam al Dhahabi says this about him Min Ghulat al Shia wa Ru'us al Bid'a, lakinahu Sadiq fil Hadith. He was from the extreme Shia, from the heads of their leaders, like the, of their innovation, but he was trustworthy in hadith. Abu Hatim al-Razi says, Shaykhun Thiqa. He was a trustworthy expert. Ibn Khuzayma, he says, uh, he relates from him also. He says, Haddathana al-Thiqa fi riwayatihi al-Muttaham fi dinihi, Abad. So he described him as one who was trustworthy in narration, but in his personal beliefs, he was questionable. He was accused. So Bukhari only took one hadith from him. It's in Kitab al tawheed And it comes after a second isnad. The first isnad is a primary isnad, so it comes as a supporting isnad. So it's not like a primary hadith, it's a supporting hadith, but he still included him. So that's something remarkable, right? What does that tell you? It tells you that Bukhari, it tells you something about the mind of Bukhari. He's trying to get all the sound information. He wants, he doesn't want to miss anything. He doesn't want to deprive you of any sound knowledge, even if it comes from a source that's Shia. Can you imagine saying that in, in a masjid today? <laughs> like, you can't say that today, like, because we are so set in our ways. And, you know, times are also very different. But this is unbelievable. Uh, like, you want to turn this off? It's making too much noise for me. Just press the off button. So that's Abad bin Yaqub. Okay. Oh, yeah. It could be similar to that. Yeah, getting Ayatul Kursi from Shaytan. I don't, uh, I'm not going to quote the hadith, but, you know, if so, Bukhari, what he was doing is he was making sure the information is sound. It wasn't really about like the individuals, right? It was more, I mean, the individuals are part of that. But his primary priority was to get the sound information. So if he was certain that Abad related a hadith and he came from the Prophet, وسلم, he didn't mind reporting it, even if he was someone like who he was, an extreme Shia. There's another name. I'll pause after the other reporter, and then uh, you can ask questions. Can't find my window. So the second one, Ubaidullah ibn Musa of Kufa, also another Shia reporter. Ubaidullah ibn Musa ibn Abil Mukhtar Badam. He was a Kufan Hadith expert, born in 128, died in 212 or to, to 214. So he was a prominent Shia and also a Hadith expert. He had a strong memory who was not known to lie. Bukhari actually took many Hadith from him, not one. Abu Dawood described him in his biography, he was a burning Shia, meaning like he was so strong in his sect. It wasn't just that, you know, he was sympathetic. He was part of that uh, movement and sect. So, but Abu Dawood, despite that description, even he took his hadith. So pretty much all the major hadith experts took from him, except for Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal. So here you'll find that, you know, there's going to be differences of opinion. Now you're getting into gray zone and, and, and territory that's unchartered. Everyone's going to have their own approach, right? But in general, the early Muslim, the early Hadith experts, they were more open and flexible than we are today. Um, they took from other sources. 
Um, but among them, there were some that were more more strict. Some of them were like, you know, they would absolutely not take from people like that. So one of them was Ahmad ibn Hanbal. So Imam Ahmad, for instance, he was very careful, and very strict about innovation. So he did not take his hadith, everyone else did. Um, also between Bukhari and Muslim, there is a difference. Imam Muslim was much more strict um, and erred on the side of caution. He would reject uh, people like that. But Imam Bukhari, he was much more bold. He wanted to find, you know, investigate. If he was certain the narrations are okay, he would be bold enough to, and he had the courage to use them. But Muslim, he generally did not. So Ahmad, he had a strong difference of opinion on that. Um, Yahya ibn Ma'in uh, said he was reliable. So Yahya and Ahmad were companions, right? They, they would often travel together. So Imam Ahmad would say, no, he's an evil person. He mixes up hadith, don't take them. Yahya ibn Ma'in said, no, he's reliable. Write his hadith down. So Imam Ahmad wrote a strongly worded letter to Yahya rebuking him for taking the narrations of Ubaidullah bin Musa. And then Yahya wrote back rebuking him, saying that you take from Abdul Razak Sana'ani, another hadith expert of Yemen, who also was like a pro-Shia, but although he, he probably wasn't a card-carrying member, and he said, we both know that he criticized Uthman, which is much more serious than Ubaidullah criticizing Muawiyah. So, you know, so here's, you know, it tells you these are human beings. They have differences of opinion. Um, so actually only Ahmad ibn Hanbal left his hadith. So there are 52 hadith in Bukhari from him and 42 in Sahih Muslim from him. 42 in Sahih Muslim and 52 in Sahih Bukhari from Ubaidullah ibn Musa. Yes. You want to just pass that? Because we have online students, they can hear. Otherwise, I have to repeat the question, if you don't mind. So, from my conversation with uh, Shiyas and the you know, debates, they actually uh, favor Muslim over Bukhari. So is there a reason for that? Oh, do they? Yeah. That's surprising because Muslim generally didn't take their hadith. Like, uh, so, Muslim generally did not, like, he was more careful, he would reject these types of narrators. Um, and Bukhari, in general, he was more bold in taking the hadith. But it's not a general rule. It's not. So what I'm trying to teach you is not that Bukhari took from Shia. Generally, he avoided them like most people. But when there was a person who was known for hadith, he's known to be trustworthy, and he has hadith, he wouldn't mind taking from them. But he would still do investigation. It's not that, okay, Ubaidullah, he accepts all his hadith. Not that Abad, he only took one hadith of Abad. That shows you he rejected most of his hadith. But he took one of his. That means he still was acceptable enough for him to consider learning from and taking from. Okay. Um, oh, Allah Alam, that's a good exercise. So that's a great exercise for. So this is how you learn. So there are fifty-two hadith in Sahih Bukhari. And a good exercise would be locating all those hadith that are related from Ubaidullah bin Musa. It's very easy to do. You can use online databases or search for Haddathana or Ubaidullah bin Musa and make a list of those hadith and see what they're about. And if you find a pattern, maybe that'll tell us something about maybe there are certain topics that he takes from them. That's excellent, excellent uh, research. So I don't know the answer. Um, let me move on. So let's move on to a different sect. Okay. So now you have Ali ibn Ja'ad of Baghdad. He was Jahmi, follower of Jaham ibn Safwan. Ali ibn Ja'ad. So he was Jahmi. He was a great hadith expert of Baghdad. He was known for his precision and accuracy. And he was a prominent student of Shorba. And he's considered in Baghdad the best student of Imam Shorba. He was also a student of the two Sufyans, Sufyan Athori and Sufyan ibn Uyayna. So that means he had great teachers, very high teachers, teachers of the previous generation that made his hadith very valuable. He had high isnad. So Shorba, what do you know? remember about Shorba? Anyone remember Shorba? There's, Shorba is a great hadith expert. He's considered the founder of the hadith, the science of Ilal. 
hadith criticism. Because he was so careful, so strict. Uh, for him, like he was so strict about narrators, so he had, like he's had so many statements like Tadlis Akhuz Kathib. Tadlis is the brother of lying, you know, like misrepresentation of the Isnad. So Shorba was very careful, very strict, very precise. So Ali ibn Jab being his best student, you know that he would favor precision as well. But however, he was Jahmi in theology. So let me tell you what some people said about him. Abu Hatim al-Razi said, Kana Ali ibn Ja'ad al-Jawhari mutqinan saduqan walam ara min al-muhaddithina man yuhfad wa ya'ti bil hadith ala lafz wahid la yugayiruhu ghayra qabisa wa abi na'im wa yahya al-hamnani wa sharik wa Ali ibn Ja'ad. So Abu Hatim al-Razi says he was a proficient, accurate expert. And I haven't found among the muhaddathin those who are so exact in their wording. And every time they report, they use the same words. More than the following individuals, they mention a number, including Ali ibn Ja'ad. So, so many people said things about him. Thiqa Ma'mun, Darukutni described him as someone who's trustworthy, fully, and reliable. Abu Zura al-Razi said, Huwa Saduq, Katabtu Anhu, he is reliable, I, re I relate from him. And Nasai call him Sadu. So all the great hadith experts, they mention his reliability, his precision. So Ahmad ibn Hanbal, again, remember, Imam Ahmad you always find, and to a lesser extent, Imam Muslim were more careful and more strict against innovation and things like that. So from him, you find ambivalent statements. You find statements that he forbade his son from taking from him. Um, but you also find statements, um, so someone, Khalaf ibn Salim says, Sirtu ana wa Ahmed ibn Hanbal wa Yahya ibn Ma'in ila Ali ibn Ja'ad. Um, so I traveled and I met Ali ibn Ja'ad along with Ahmed ibn Hanbal and Yahya ibn Ma'in. Um, La najidu fi kitabi la khattan wahidan. He said, he came, so, so he described that, so they entered upon Ali ibn Ja'ad and Ali ibn Ja'ad, okay, he brings out his books because they wanted to learn hadith. And he goes back to prepare like some food for them because they're guests. So while he was gone, he's the Ahmed ibn Hanbal, Yahya ibn Ma'in, and this scholar Khalaf bin Salim says, we started going through his books. And we started checking his hadith. And they're already experts. So they said, we didn't find except one mistake. So from what, like the time they had, they went through it, they didn't find, they only found one mistake. And then he says, when we finish eating, falamma faragna min al ta'am, he says, hatu. And then, um, and then he says, um, he started relating hadith, and then we already read his books, so we were checking. And he said he related exactly what was in his books, well, making no mistakes. So, so, but he was, so Ahmad ibn Hanbal, there are reports that he um, forbade his son from taking from him. There are also reports of someone um, looking into the books of Ahmad ibn Hanbal. Abu Zura al-Razi says he saw the books of Imam Ahmad. And every hadith of Ali bin Jad was crossed out. So there was a line over it. So it seems like maybe either he stopped taking from him, or he changed his mind, or perhaps his son crossed out those lines, or maybe he was more strict for his son. Allahu alam. But there's this ambivalence uh, regarding certain people. Uh, uh, well, Jahmi, I'll explain to you, but let me, I'll get through what everyone said about him, then I'll tell you it's an aqidah thing. So Ali ibn Madini, he says, um, someone asked him, "Who's man? Ayyuhuma habu ilayk fi Shu'ba? Ali bin Jad or Shababa?" Someone asked from Shu'ba, "Who's a better reliable narrator?" And the answer was Ali bin Jad. Um, so he was. So what was his problem? So what's what's the whole problem? That's what his stress. So Jaham ibn Safwan was an early person who kind of separated one of the early earliest individuals separate from Ahl sunnah to start a different path and then eventually people started following him so Jaham ibn Safwan was executed in the year 128 so you can say he's the founder of this school of thought it's a school of thought of theology their full beliefs are not entirely clear but only a few like attributes so they kind of believe that only a few attributes can be predicated to Allah such as creation, such as power, 
But then, so they'll say, well, Allah does not speak. So they'll say, you can't attribute speech to Allah. So because of that, they'll say the Quran is a creation. It's not the speech of Allah. So that's one of their founding beliefs that the Quran is the speech. It's not, it's not the speech of Allah. It's a creation of Allah. So, and that's, that's the belief that kind of took over the Abbasid empire when Ahmad ibn Hanbal was tortured. And this is why he was tortured, because he refused to uh, capitulate to the idea that the Quran is created. Because the Khalifa, at the time, he adopted this uh, school of thought, the Jahmi school of thought. And he was forcing everyone to, you know, agree and testify that the Quran is makhluq, created. So, so that's one of their main beliefs. And Imam Ahmad refused, everyone else relented, and he was tortured in prison for a long time. That whole inquisition against Imam Ahmad was a Jahmi inquisition. So, so it was a huge school of thought. It took over the Muslim world at some point in time. So basically they deny many of the names and attributes of Allah. Um, so in Iman, they're kind of like, so in Iman, they're close to another sect called the Murji'ah. The Murji'ah are followers of, of Tupac Shakur. Only God can judge me, all right? So only God can judge me. No matter what you do, no one can judge you. Everyone is the same in belief. You could be the worst, you could be a clubber, and you and Abu Bakr and Siddiq have the same level of Iman, because Iman is just you believe in Allah or not, yes or no. So it's not something that goes up or down, it's something just you have and it's static. So, and no one has the right to excommunicate anyone no matter what you do. As long as you believe in Allah, you don't have to pray, you don't have to do anything, not a single deed. So only Allah is, is so this is something revived in modern times. A lot of people have this idea, um, or they're, they're sympathetic to this idea that um, only Allah can judge. We can't comment on anyone's belief. Someone says he's Muslim, we take it for face value. Of course, that's true to some extent, but these people take it to an absolute extreme. Also, Jahmi, they believe that heaven and hell will disappear. It doesn't go forever. Um, so there's so many beliefs that they have, yes. Mm. Yeah, so they believe that, you know, you know, people will be punished and, and given rewards for a period of time, but it doesn't make sense for someone to be punished forever when they sin only for a few years and so on and so forth. So, so we're not sure, it wasn't a, because it's so early on, so we don't know exactly what they believe, but there are many other sects developed later. They took aspects of their beliefs. So Ali bin Jad was Jahmi. So what, what were the two problems he had? The two problems he had was one is he believed or he didn't clearly say that the Quran is a speech of Allah. Okay. Um, so they would ask him, is the Quran the speech of Allah? So he would give answers like, yes, it's the speech of Allah. But if someone says it's created, it's not a big deal, then I wouldn't criticize that person. So you can tell that he was like inclining towards that belief. Also, the other issue he had was like he would criticize the companions. So he didn't have any issues with criticizing the companions and many of the early Muslims. And for them, that's that's a no-no, right? Like so even today, you have the same issue. People who are bold enough to start criticizing companions um, in sometimes harsh ways for what they did. Um, that makes you person, persona non grata for some people. So like he used to criticize Ibn Omar, for instance, and would say harsh words about him and about Muawiyah, for instance, about Uthman. People asked him, do you believe Uthman misappropriated the wealth of the Muslims for his personal gain? He said, yes, he did things against Allah's right. Um, so, and he was adamant on that. People kept asking him and so, so he had these issues with him, so like uh, that kind of like was different from the trajectory of the early Muslims. Generally, they tried to refrain from criticizing companions, but some of them did. So, so the point here is like you have this, this individual who was who's kind of like complex, right? So he had a number of issues, criticizing companions, follower of Jaham ibn Safwan, but yet so many people took from him, so they didn't eliminate him entirely. So that's an important point. So. Today, what happens is like, you know, someone gets labeled, right? And even not just today, but even after that period, people get labeled and then they're immediately eliminated. And then you never have nothing to do with that person and just use those labels 
But when you look at the early history, even Imam Bukhari's time, you find things are much more complex. You know, people are learning from each other. They're not you know, closing doors entirely. There's much more flexibility than there is today. So Muslim, so now what did Muslim, Muslim I told you was very strict also. So Muslim got hundreds of hadith um, with high isnads from Ali bin Jad from Shorba and from Sufyan Athori. So Shorba, Sufyan Athori, huge name. So Muslim narrating from Ali, from Sufyan, only one link. But then Muslim, at the, you know, he wound up rejecting him. He threw all those hadith out. And he took none, none of those hadith. So in, in Sahih Muslim, every time he relates hadith from Sufyan, it's with two, two links. So that's huge. That's a big sacrifice. He gave up such a high isnad for favor of shorter isnad. So now he narrates from a student of a student of Sufyan. So the minimum of two links to Sufyan and to Shorba. Had he kept Ali bin Ja'ad, he would add only one and it would make his work much more valuable. But Muslim and, and Bukhari, they had, they had a, a different methodology. They had slightly different. So it's about two things here. So you had There's two things that we talked about in... So, remember the five conditions? It all goes back to the five conditions of Sahih. The five conditions of Sahih. What are the five conditions? Now somebody must have memorized those two lines. It's only been like 20 times that I express my disappointment with you guys. Okay, no, but the line. I want someone to show me the line of the Bekunia. Awalu has Sahihu. Wahu Matasal. Isnaduhu. Walam Yushadha Aw Yual. Yarwihi Adlun Dabitun and Mithlihi. Mortamadun Fidabti Hunaklihi. I'm still disappointed in you guys. So. What are the, the mainstay? The connected is not, but what are the other two? Dabt and Adal. What's Dabt? Accuracy. What's Adala? Justice. But not justice, but what does it mean in Hadith? Moral uprightness. So one is an academic uh, standard, the other is a moral standard. So this is a subjective science. It's not like mathematics. Like, you know, you have to judge human beings. Every reporter is a human being. So for Bukhari, Dabt was a priority over Adal. What does that mean? Bukhari wanted to make sure this person actually heard these hadith and he's accurate in his reporting. He still believed in Adal, but his standard in Adal was a little lower because he privileged Dabt over Adal. So Ali bin Jad was super accurate. For Bukhari, that was fine, even though he had problems with his beliefs because Adil is more important to him slightly, but I'm uh, sorry, Dabt was more important. Imam uh, Muslim was much more pious and careful in that sense. So he privileged Adil. So, and him and Imam Ahmad also. For them, anyone who has a wrong belief or accused of an innovation, automatic they would eliminate them. They don't care whether he's lying or not, or he's trustworthy or not, accurate or not. So it's just a matter of what you privilege over the other. What's your priority? So. In essence, Bukhari was more academic, he's more bold, and I think that's a much more bold stance. He favored accuracy and truthfulness, while Muslim was more morally strict, uh, and he favored avoiding heresy and deviation and so on and so forth. Bukhari's primary concern, remember his vision, is to teach you the sunnah. If someone is honest and accurate in teaching the sunnah, no problem. And he sees no reason to leave his reports just because of a belief they have that doesn't impact that report. Okay. So he was more nuanced than Muslim and Imam Ahmad. For them, okay, someone had these beliefs, that's a red flag for them, they would just eliminate them. So that's kind of like how you understand the difference between the various scholars. Um, I have one more reporter to then you can open up the floor. Uh, Ikrimah, he was a Khariji. Now we're moving along in our line of sex. So Ikrima was a Kharijite. Okay. 
So his name was Abu Abdullah Ikrima of Medina. He was a freed slave of Ibn Abbas, the companion of Ibn Abbas. So he was a Berber, North African freed slave of Ibn Abbas. And because he was a freed slave, he became one of his best students and he's one of the best reporters of Ibn Abbas. He's a master of hadith and tafsir. So the, one of the best reporters from Ibn Abbas was Akrima. Even Ibn Abbas himself, he made Akrima give fatawa and answer questions in his own lifetime. And he put him in his chair in his lifetime. And he's the one who told him to settle in Mecca in order to teach people and give fatwa. And eventually he was appointed a judge in North Africa. He died in the year 105. So he's much older. So he's not a teacher of Bukhari, but he's someone much higher up in the chain. So just an example that Bukhari even took higher up in the chain some individuals that were disputed. So what was his problem? Two things he was accused of. One is Kharijism. So he was inclining towards uh, Kharij. Kharijism was like another sect that uh, um, developed early on. So basically, what they did was, with, what's the belief of the Khawarij? Khawarij or Khariji? Uh-huh. Yeah, so um, you can't commit sin and be a Muslim, basically. So it's kind of the opposite of the Murjah. Murjah, you can commit every sin, you're still Muslim, like Abu Bakr, because only God can judge you. But then Kharijism, if you commit zina, you do something, you're no longer Muslim. So they're, they're quick at excommunicating, making kafir. So you cannot be Muslim while you're committing sin. So because of that stance, and then historically what happened, they're the ones that withdrew from the army of Ali. So they opposed Ali, and they're the ones that ultimately killed him. And they opposed also the other side. And so they were involved in a lot of early violence in the Muslim community. So they were known for excommunication and violence, and they were very harsh and strict, uh, and known for not having a lot of depth of knowledge, but they took things at face value. So Hikrima, Abi, again, wasn't a card-carrying member as much early, but he was inclining towards them. So he was accused of that. And then number two, he was also accused by some people of lying. So Ibn Hajar says about him, he is thiqa, thabt, the scholar of tafsir, uh, tafsir um, and he says that those who accuse him of lying, that's not proven. Uh, and nor is the bid'ah of any kind proven from him. So, so there's this ambivalence about him. The people rejected these accusations about him. Some um, accepted them. But this is one of the few accused narrators of Bukhari that are among like people higher up in the chain. So Bukhari, for him, he didn't meet that threshold of rejection, that kind of innovation he had. He still had great knowledge and... All the books of tafsir are filled with Akrima, you know, reports from Akrima, what he said about this verse or that verse, despite being uh, either a member of the Kharijis or close to that sect or being accused of that. So in conclusion, we have these two broad uh, approaches, people who, who are open and willing to take from such individuals and those who are much more strict did not take from them. Among the people who were strict was people who were people like Imam Malik. Imam Malik he used to say, La yu'khadu hadith nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in sahibi hawa. The hadith of the Nabi are not taken from the people of innovation or people of desires. Yadur nasa ila hawahu. Wala min kathabin yakribu fi hadithin. So, fi hadithin nas. Nor is it taken from a liar. Um, so Imam Malik was known to be very strict about innovation. Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal, I mentioned him several times, that he was someone who was very strict. So ila Ahmed ibn Hanbal, yuktabu anil murji wal qadariya wa ghayrihima min ahli al-hawa, qala na'am idha lam yakun yadru ilayhi wa yukthiru al-kalama fif. So he said basically, so in one report he said, someone asked him, can we take from murji'a, qadariya, and these sects? He said, as long as they're not calling to that, then you can. But if they're leaders and calling to their innovation, then no, you cannot. So, um, there was another approach. So, so that's one approach, avoiding innovations and innovators entirely. And then another approach was being more bold and just investigating case by case basis. And that was Bukhari. And maybe you can say most of the Hadith experts. Um, and then there's also another nuanced way of looking at it, which is that 
you look at individual sex. So for instance, the Shia were known to lie more than other sects. So because they lied frequently, a lot of people were more careful about taking from them. Bukhari only took from them when he was certain of their accuracy. So he didn't take it from them when they were lying, right? Like he would investigate. So Ibn Taymiyyah, for instance, he says, it is unlikely that anyone one can accept from Shia authorities because of their frequent lying, which is why those concerned with authenticity generally do not narrate from them. Bukhari and Muslim don't narrate from Ali except from his own family, and he gives examples. Um, and then on the other side, the Khawarij, because they believe all sins take you outside of Islam, they were more strict about lying. So they had the least lying in their ranks. So with the Khawarij, at least you could be certain that this person is not purposely lying. Because if he did, like by his own beliefs, he's no longer Muslim. So the Khawarij and the Shia are the two opposite sides in terms of like lying. And they're the, and generally speaking, in terms of like their leaders known to be truthful or not in narrations. Yes, Anu. So how do you differentiate between individual reports of these individuals? Yeah, like the one I'm discussing the issue of the that they would be moderating, but then the number of how do you take some how do you come back? And then even though they weren't sort of about it, so like they did not narrate data or um they didn't narrate data or yeah, so they were selective, right, from every teacher. So every teacher, they were selective. So Bukhari, who was famously known for what? From every teacher discerning which reports of that teacher are mistakes, even from great teachers like Shorba. So that's why everywhere he would go, he would clarify these are the mistakes of the Zuhri's reports. These are the mistakes of Shorba. Of course, he would do the same thing with these individuals. But these individuals in general, like I don't want you to get the impression that, uh, that you know, he's taken from everyone. But what he's doing is he's he's not afraid to take generally he's not taking from a lot of people like the Shia individual is just just a handful and how many hadith one of them is only one hadith or bad bin yaqu is one hadith it's not even a primary hadith it's a secondary hadith and the other one is 24. so he takes more from Abedullah than ali uh, than um Abad bin yaqu so he's highly selective of course and one approach would be for sure if there's a someone who's shia and he's relating a report about Ahlul Bayt, then that's a conflict of interest, right? So there, like Muhaddisin would eliminate that. They would not take that report because now you're part of a sect that believes in a certain thing and reporting something that supports your sect. So now there's a clear conflict of interest. So then they would also look at the contents as well. Um, so they were very careful. They would investigate. They would compare the reports of these teachers to others in order to, once you start comparing massive amount of reports, you get a sense of which reports are accurate, which are not, okay? Um, so, for instance, okay, Yahya ibn Sa'id al-Qattan, the teacher of Bukhari, um, narrates a conversation he had with Ali ibn Madini. So, Ali ibn Madini uh, said to Yahya, look, Abdurrahman ibn Mahdi stated that he doesn't take from the leaders of innovation. Yahya al-Qattan, a great expert, he started laughing, he said, what would you do with Qatada, who is known to deny Qadr? What would you do with Umar ibn Abi Dhar al-Hamdani, who was known to be Murja? And he said so on and so forth. And um, Ali ibn Madini used to say, if I leave the people of Basra because they denied Qadr, people of Kufa because their Shia inclinations, all the books would be gone. Or even Hassan al-Basri had some problems. He was accused of some problems with his belief. Because generally speaking, the Qadarites were in Basra, so everyone in Basra will be affected by the, the trend of the region. And the Shias were in Kufa and other sects, and so many people will be affected by that. So you develop these partisan affiliations with your region, right? And that kind of affects everyone. So you might not be a card-carrying member of a group, but you start, and you become affected by that. That's why, you know, when Abu, uh, you know, Abu Hanifa came to Imam Malik and Muhammad ibn Hassan also, Ma Malik was so careful by innovation when he said, where are you from, O Kufa? And then he, you know, he got so careful. Oh, you're from that region of sects. 
And Abu Hanifa, no, Ata actually, Ata ibn Abi Rabah said that to Abu Hanifa, where are you from? And that was, he was a muhaddith of Mecca. Abu Hanifa said from Kufa, he said, oh, from the region of all those sects. Which group do you belong to? So Abu Hanifa famously said, I belong to the group that does not criticize the companions. I belong to the group that believes the Quran is the word of Allah. And I belong to the group that uh, does not deny the qadr of Allah. So so then you say, okay, you're good. So Abu Hanifa was new and he was able to navigate uh, from all of these groups and avoid them. But that's what happens when, when, when these regions develop these great ideologies and they affect large amounts of people. So anyway, the point here, what are some concluding lessons? Um, don't be afraid to take from anyone. Try to be careful, but you know, also be flexible at the same time and taking from people. There's a great principle. Um, I did say it in some classes prior to this, but I'll write it on the board. It's a this is a golden principle for students of knowledge. Kamish, Tumma, Fatish. Kamish, Tumma, Fatish. What does that mean? Who knows what that means? Yeah, so Kamish means collect everything and later investigate things. So, what is that? How does that apply to students of knowledge? Students of knowledge. You have to learn from everyone. You have to read every book. So in your early stages, you have to do it with like some sophistication so you don't get lost. But you shouldn't be afraid from learning from everyone. And all the muhaddithin, Imam Bukhari took from 1,080 teachers. Only used 321 of them. That means 700 of his teachers weren't good enough for him to narrate from. So he didn't accept their reports at all for the Sahih. So he was selective. But if you're selective as a student, you're not going to learn anything because everyone's a uh, deviant for you. Everyone belongs to something. That, there's only one person on the planet that you'll learn from. Then you're not really going to learn. You're just going to perpetuate a bubble. So every scholar worth their soul, they travel the world. They learn from everyone. So at your stage of, as a student, you should be humble, learning from people. You don't have to agree with the teacher. But you learn from them, and then once you start learning from many teachers, you start developing your own mind, and you start developing, sifting through the information, and you take the good and you leave the bad. So, fatish is investigation. So, qamish thumma fatish. Yes, or from Take this. So, some, some people, they're very conservative. They, they think that learning from one teacher may kind of put them in one side spectrum and they just follow that one person and that's why they avoid it completely. Is that a good approach? So learning from one, they one like one group basically and you have they they have a label associated with them. And mm -hmm. the fear is that if you learn from them or you learn something from them, that they might test you to learn, you know, join their group or become part of that label. So they avoid that teacher completely. Yeah, so that if you, if you're gonna learn from Bukhari, that's not a good approach. That's why I'm sharing this. Like and these aren't his major teachers, but I thought it was important. Most people don't know this. Like uh, you know, if the early Muhaddith, even someone as careful as Bukhari, someone who only took the strongest reports, wasn't afraid to take from people who were part of other groups. What did that make us today? So you know, that's that's the key to you know being part of an ummah. You have an ummah. Ummah is not a group. Most people believe the ummah is that group, and everyone else is not the ummah. So, if you believe in some notion of ummah, that means ummah is going to be larger than just your group. And even the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, my ummah will be split up into seventy-something sects. So he didn't say my ummah is only one. He said my ummah will be split up. So he still called them my ummah. So there's still some redeeming value in part of being part of an ummah. And when you read these books of hadith, you'll find every sect, every group, and they're learning from each other. There's no such thing as only one exclusive group. Every isnad of hadith has all types of people in it. There are people who are ashari, people who are athari, 
people who are Shafi'i, Hanbali, all sorts of people. So in our tradition, it wasn't as strict that it was as many people make it out to today. If you do that, you lose out on so much. You create, you know, so many problems. So we shouldn't be afraid to, we shouldn't be afraid to have our beliefs. Like, you know more than anyone. Like, I'm a strong believer in certain things when it comes to fiqh and hadith and weak hadith. And But I have teachers from all spectrums. Like, I mean, I'm not afraid to sit and learn. And you respectfully take what you learn and, and um, what, what, what you believe is right. And those things you disagree with, you just disagree. But that's how you advance your horizons. Awesome. Is it getting hot? I think maybe we should turn it on again, right? Yeah. Okay, so how you have did, to get closer, I think. How did Bukhari convince Abad bin Yaqub to, uh, to, to be a teacher? Or how did he become one of the students? Oh, we don't know. So he probably, I mean, it's complicated. Maybe, maybe he was part of a dictation circle. And, uh, you know, he just came and he was part of a, sometimes there's, tens of thousands of students um, or like thousands of students sitting there but Allahu Alam I don't know the answer to that okay, one more question was so was there any sect that Bukhari can, uh, considered like uh, the fall like out of the fall of Islam because it seems like he was pretty you know, flexible with his, he's considering everyone here Muslim right all these obvious all these teachers well the teachers yeah if it was non-Muslim we wouldn't take home right so if you can at least say he considered them Muslim, the ones he narrated from. We don't, like, so Bukhari did not write about his methodology. So someone breathing it like that, they don't got time for that. They don't have time to tell you what they're doing. They just do it. So now we're figuring out his life, his methodology, and there's research going on to see, like, there's so, so much more to be discovered about his methodology. But from this, I mean, he's flexible, but not fully flexible. So, like, it's not the case that they're taking from everyone. They're still going to the hadith experts of the region. So for him, it's by hadith expertise. He's not just going to a city and learning from everyone. That's not what's going on. He's going to every city or going to regions, and the people who have the best hadith in that region, the people who are known to teach, and the teachers, the solid teachers, that's who he's taking from, but not from everyone. That's why he said, I took from 1,080 teachers, every single one of them, sahibu hadith. If they're known in hadith circles. So he does that methodology for him is like, you have to be a professional teacher of hadith, not just Joe Shmo. And it's something amazing. Like, if imagine Bukhari related hadith from Ahmed ibn Hanbal. That would make his hadith so, so much higher than they are. But what was he doing? He met Imam Ahmed and they were walking and they were doing mudhakara. Mudhakara is they just discuss matters and you review hadith. So he wasn't sitting in a classroom learning those hadith. So Bukhari is so accurate. His methodology is to get a hadith, it's not to relate it. You have to sit in a classroom properly. The teacher has to have his books in front of him. The teacher has to narrate and you write them down. Only then he relates them. But if you're just walking and he, he reviewed hundreds of hadith with Imam Ahmad, but he didn't relate any of them in his sahih. He relates the hadith in his sahih through other people from Ahmad because he doesn't consider that real um, you know, relay, relaying of knowledge. So it seems like it's not he's taking everywhere and everyone. He's looking at hadith experts. Sometimes those hadith experts happen to belong to other sects. And he probably had some bar in his mind that, okay, I'll take from him, or this might be beyond. Who knows? Allah Alam, what was that red line for him? There must have been some red line. Do we know of anyone who's had hadith rejected because of the person theology? Probably. I'm sure if you look in the history books and uh, the books of Ayla, there are many cases because because in his time there were so many theological groups and he's not taken from all of them. So the fact that he took from 1,080 teachers rather than 10,000, he was already selective in his teachers. And from the teachers that he learned from, he didn't use all, he only used 300 of them. He was even more selective. So he was for sure going through a selection process. What was that selection process? We know his five conditions. These are his conditions. Adal, Dab, continuous isnad, free of hidden weaknesses, free of contradictions. These are Bukhari and Muslim conditions, not anyone else. They came up with these. So that was his criteria. And, but like, like I said, it's a little more fine. Like sometimes you privilege one over the other. It makes you look at things slightly differently. 
But Bukhari was much more bold. As a personality, as a mind, he was a genius. He was bold. He's trying to solve problems. He was uh, teaching you so much in the book, and he's just like doing incredible things. So if there's information out there that can enhance our knowledge of the Sunnah, even if it might come from a questionable source, as long as the information is sound. So the source might be questionable, but the report is not. That's the point. It could be a, the narrator is weak, but the report is not weak because through his research, this report is sahih. This is not a sahih, although the narrator might have some issues. So he was like looking at things much more sophisticated ways, like the isnad. So sometimes it's, he'll take one isnad, and, or he'll reject an isnad with the same names, and he'll take it in similar names, but because of the circumstance, okay, this was related in Egypt. And this scholar, we know when he went to Egypt, he didn't have his books with him. But when he was in Medina, he had his books with him. So he'll take the same Isnad only when it's related in Medina. So that's looking at things in a much more sophisticated way than just a list of names. So we're trying to learn his methodology. There's so much research being done on him. But that's what happens when you have brilliant minds. You can spend lifetimes learning about them and because they were just exceptional people. We can't you know, we're still learning about them and their their work. Allah. Anyone else? Anyone online? So Dr. we have this popular reputation culture. So has anyone been audacious enough to actually do that for Namahari? Uh, refute Bukhari? No, man. Allah protected him, man. So it's it's unbelievable. There's no one, you know, they, and we started this, we mentioned this in the beginning of the class. There's no other human being in the world that reached his maqam for some reason that almost everyone accepts him. Um, except some other sects, obviously, they would reject him. And a lot of hadith rejectors, they're always criticizing Bukhari. But among the Muslims, um, almost everyone takes from him. No one really denies that his is the most authentic book of hadith, except for like extreme innovative, uh, like deviant sects. Some of them might, like the Shia, they don't respect sorry, Bukhari, but they're always using Bukhari to prove their points. So that's, Allah made them do that. Every time of oh, the 12 Imams, it's in your Bukhari, they're still using Bukhari. So like, but Allah made his status such that his name is next to Allah, Rasul Rawahul Bukhari. No other human being has that status. I mean, there's something special about him that someone who reaches his status. And until the end of time, he's the one who preserved the Sunnah for us. He presented this marvelous book showing us the Sunnah. So, so the, Alhamdulillah, there's not a lot of refutations of Bukhari. There were some like criticism of him, but they're very respectful criticism. In the end, Bukhari wins. Like Dar Qutni, his Ailal is a whole, supposed to be a refutation of Bukhari, but it's, it's basically a critique of the hadith that Bukhari missed and the hadith that are, should not be in his book. But when you read the book, his, he kind of admits in most cases Bukhari's right. And in other cases, it might be a soft, like he might be right or you might. So even that criticism, refutation, increased his stature even more. And now no one really disputes it. But the thing people do is they don't dispute that Bukhari is the most authentic, but they don't really give him the status that he deserves. They'll say, okay, Bukhari is the most authentic, but then they'll take from Tabarani. And they're always quoting other people in their khutbah. But these people who use weak hadith, they're not respecting Bukhari's work. By name, they respect the work of Bukhari, but in actuality, they're not. Because what are they doing? They're taking from every source. If you know what he did, what's the point of, if you're taking from every hadith book out there, uh, even weak and even fabricated, then what's the point of Bukhari? Like, then you don't even understand what he did or respect what he did. So he purified the sunnah for us, so you should be using him a lot more. And his hadith should be separate from everyone else's hadith. Allahu a'lam. Yes, sister. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. So Abad bin Yaqub, no, but Ubaid bin Musa, yes, in the primary corpus, you have hadith from them. Um, so you have 52 hadith in Bukhari. Most of them will be in the primary corpus, if not all of them. 
And we can pull up hadith of each teacher and see which one, where he includes it. It's very easy to do. I don't have, only had one example. Abad bin Yaqub, because he only shared his hadith once. So I have that example, but the other ones are available. They're in the primary corpus. Okay. Yeah, so he's, he calls them sahibu hadithin. That means it's much broader than muhadith. He doesn't say all of them were muhadithin or hadith experts. So all of them were people known in hadith sciences. So among them were experts, among them were less than experts, or among them people just narrated hadith. So he took from a lot of them. Mm -hmm. But that's the 1080, if you're asking about that. So he used some of them in other books, and some of them he never used. But 321 of them were the ones he was certain about. Most of them are experts. So that's what he was looking for. Okay. We're good? Oh, kamit thumafatish means collect everything and investigate and scrutinize later. Collect everything and scrutinize the information later. Zimbai. Rather mm -hmm. another uh, book that's found in almost every Muslim household. Does Imam Rawi also uses a lot of his hadiths from Bukhari and Muslim or? Yeah, of course. If you, anyone read Riyadh al-Salihin, the first hadith, first few hadith of every chapter are always Bukhari and Muslim. So yeah, so, so but Riyadh al-Salihin is a tertiary book, it's not a primary book. So it's just Imam Nawi's selection, it's a beautiful selection of hadith, mostly from Bukhari and Muslim, and then sometimes from other books. So even there, you can tell Nawi is privileging Bukhari and Muslim. Even the, the alternative of Riyadh al-Salihin in the Indian world is Mishkat al-Masabih. In the East, that's more popular than Riyadh al-Salihin. And even there, the first hadith of every chapter always Bukhari and Muslim. So everyone understood that Bukhari and Muslim were the best, and they tried to follow that. Even the Arba'in, a lot of them are from Bukhari and Muslim. Not all of them, but a lot of them. Anyone else? Okay. Right here. Let's take a quick picture so we can we can move on. So now let's final session, let's read our hadith. So last week's hadith we did not finish, or did you, you get it? Okay. So the final hadith, or, or last week's hadith, we didn't finish the entire hadith. We need to finish it today, because we have seven hadith to cover, and next week is the final week of the class. So this is Darul Minhaj, I took a screenshot, so it's on your board, um, online students. Um, Okay, here we go. Yeah, for online students, I have it on the board, on the slide, rather. So we were reading, um, Musa, you want to give this hadith book to Ibrahim? You might need to read from there. So we were reading the hadith with this primary isnad that you see on the board. It was very, very important. This was a hadith from uh, Yahya ibn Bukair, uh, Egyptian teacher of Bukhari from Layth ibn Sa'ad, the Egyptian Imam, from Zuhri, Medinan Imam, from Urwa ibn Zubair, on the seven fuqaha of Medina, from uh, Aisha. And this is the hadith, beautiful hadith of the beginning of Revelation. Whole story of Ghari Hira, what happened, the first revelation, Iqra, coming home to Khadija, going to Waraqa. So this is the hadith, okay? So we, we read all the way up to the end, um, but then there's, there's a paragraph at the end of the hadith that's very important for more advanced students. So someone read from that paragraph. 
So you can read from your book or you can read from the screen. Now I have it on the screen for you. Someone take the mic. Bismillah. No, I can't. That's why we have copies of the, the hadith. Oh, wait, no, you don't. You have the copies of the first hadith. So someone who has, if I do that, I lose my notes here. No. Um, um, we read up to... Yeah, right there. Okay. So, Bismillah. So, what's going on here? So, the hadith has this isnad, and the hadith ended, and then at the end of the hadith, you have these comments Qala ibn Shihab. So, who's ibn Shihab? Zuhri, yeah. So that's Zuhri. So you have to know the names. So he won't say Qala Zuhri, he'll say Qala Ibn Shihab. So now Ibn Shihab is saying something. Wa akhbarani Abu Salama ibn Abdurrahman. And Abu Salama ibn Abdurrahman narrates to me. So what's going on here? So like, so we have this, it's not, where does this statement fit in? Anyone have an idea? So that often happens at the end of Hadith. This is important for you to know um, what's going on. Anyone know what was the clue? So you got to make an isnad chart for every hadith. So you know what the isnad is and this information. That's the only way to understand what's going on at the end. Sometimes after the isnad, you'll have post isnad comments. Okay. Um, so what do you think is going on? So Ibn Shihab, he's narrating from who? Yeah, go ahead. Who's online? Someone online want to say something? So Ibn Shihab is narrating from someone. Abu Salama ibn Abdurrahman. Okay, so he's narrating from a teacher. So, what is going on here? And then after Abu Salama he says what? Anna Jabir ibn Abdullah qal, wa huwa yuhadithu an fatrat al wahi. So Ibn Shihab is narrating from Abu Salama from Jabir about who starts talking about the period of. Fatrat al Wahi, when one, uh, the revelation stopped for a period of time. Okay, so. No. Uh, Online students, let me give you my board view. You're going to miss. I'm going to end these slides. So you should have the hadith in front of you when we refer to it, but you need to see the board. Okay, so so 
So basically what's happening is Dohri now relates from From Abu Salama from Jabir. So when you have like an it's not comment at the end of a, of a hadith, so Zuhri basically is relating the same, the Bukhari is relating the same isnad, but from Zuhri, Zuhri is giving you another isnad and speaking about a related hadith. So that's why it says, Qala Zuhri and Abi Salama and Najabir. So now this, this portion of the hadith towards the end, speaking about the period of revelation, it's a different part of the revelation. Now Zuhri is relating information from another teacher of his, from Jabir. Okay, so this is what the Isnad tree would look like. It's the same Isnad from down here, but now Zuhri is going from Abu Salama to Jabir. Okay, so that's that's basically what this means. So this is not a separate hadith. I mean, it is a separate hadith, but it's not like a separate Isnad. It's not a mu'allaq. It's not a supporting. But now Zuhri is continuing. So he's continuing by relating from another teacher, and he's sharing some information. So let's describe the hadith. And so first of all, Abu Salama. Who was Abu Salama ibn Abdul Rahman? So we covered his biography in Hadith 101, actually. And knowing my students, I know no one here would remember, except maybe Asim. <laughs> Abu Salama ibn Abdul Rahman ibn Auf. That's a clue. So who was that? Abu Salama ibn Abdul Rahman ibn Auf. Anyone? I mean, from the name, what do you tell me something from the name? Father of or son of Ibn? Son of Abdurrahman Ibn Auf, one of the companions. So, so remember I, the seven Fuqaha of Medina. And there was a verse, I told you to memorize this verse to remember the names. And of course, no one memorized it, and no one knows the names. So, Abu Salama was the son of Abdurrahman Ibn Auf. So from the generation after the major companions, like from the Tabi'een, there were seven children, mostly children of major companions who inherited the knowledge of the companions. And everyone, when they had a question, they were turned to these seven individuals. So these just became known as Sabah Fuqaha. So Abu Salama was one of them. He died in the year 94. So he was the son of Abdurrahman ibn Auf, uh, but his father died when he was young. So he learned a little bit from him, but mostly he learned from other senior companions uh, like Aisha radiallahu anha. He's part of the Qurayshi lineage. And so he was the number seven of the seven jurists of Medina. So you know, he was a great scholar of Medina. So he's so in the Isnad, we have to know every individual. So knowing what you know about him, is he reliable? Or is your guess? Of course, the seven Fuqaha, the best of that generation. So he's reliable, and Jabir ibn Abdullah is the companion. No need to do his biography. So, so you now the Isnad is still solid now, okay? So, but now, so what does the Isnad say? Well, not the Isnad, the Hadith. What does Isnad say? So Jabir is speaking about the period of time when revelation stopped, and he says, and he quotes a part of his Hadith that when the Prophet ﷺ was walking, he certain. Uh, he heard a voice in the heavens and the prophet raised his head and he looked up Malak. he saw the angel that had come to him in the cave of Hira sitting on a chair between the heavens and the earth in his original form so this is you know some time later the prophet saw Jibreel in his original form in his original form and then the prophet minhu. the prophet was full of fear that original fear he had in the cave, it came back, it got reignited. And then he came home and he said again to his wife, Zammiluni, cover me up. Then here Allah revealed another verse, Ya ayyuhal muddathir, kum fa'anzir, wa rijza fahjur, fahami al wahi wa tataba. After this verse was revealed, which means Ya ayyuhal muddathir, O oh, who is wrapped up in garments, kum fa'anzir, stand up and warn people. 
وَالرُّجَزَ فَحْجُرْ And رُجَزَ is the reading of Hafs. The majority of Imams, they read رِجَزَ رِجَزْ وَالرِجَزَ فَحْجُرْ um, Which means um, shun the idols. Um, so this was the verse that was revealed. And after this verse was revealed, revelation started coming in quick succession. Okay. So it's a great hadith that tells you some additional information where you know that the Prophet saw Jibi in his original form from a hadith in Sahih Muslim. We know that happened twice. Only two times the Prophet saw Jibri in his original form. One of these was this particular incident. Then Allah revealed this early surah, Ya Yul Muddathir Kum Fa'andir wa Rabba Kafakabir, wa Thiyaba Kafatahir, wa Rujaza Fahjur, wa La Tam Nun Tastakthir, wa Li Rabbi Kafasbir. So Bukhari doesn't quote the entire surah, but the first couple of verses. So, O oh you who are wrapped up, rise up and warn the people, and your Lord magnify, and your cloth clothing purify, and wa Rujaza. Fahjur or what rijaza fahjur and idols you should forsake or all defilement you should forsake depending how you translate it. So I mean, what do we learn here? We learned that this well, now is the time to start warning people. And the first thing that the Prophet was given, and this is the methodology of the Prophets, the first thing warning people, how do you warn people? Fakabir. Your Lord you should magnify. So, Mawlana um, Maududi rahimahullah in his tafsir says the amazing, he says, this verse is commanding the Prophet and the first Muslims to prepare themselves for that heavy responsibility and the burden of their mission. And, you know, here, what does it mean, Rabbaka Fakabir? It's the primary duty of the Prophets in the world is to refute the greatness of everyone in creation and to proclaim the greatness of only Allah. Universe belongs to none but Allah. That's why Rabbaka Fakabir. Your Lord is the only one you should magnify. Your Lord is the only one that is great. And from this verse, we get that great expression, Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar is Maududi described as the most distinctive and prominent emblem of the Muslims in the world today. Because Allah revealed this to begin your prayer. Allah revealed this in different units of your prayer. Allah revealed this for the Adhan, the call to prayer. Allahu Akbar. So Allahu Akbar is the motto of the Muslims. Your Lord you should magnify. Lord, your Lord is the only one. Allah is the only one that is great. No one else is great. Allah is the greatest. Um, so you have to deny the greatness of everything in the world and proclaim the greatness of Allah. So here are a couple of quick uh, insights from the verse. So why does we know that the prophets are here to give glad tidings? Bashara and Indar, and uh, also warn. But there's no glad tidings here. So one of the first verses, Qum um, Why is the glad tidings part missing here? Any thoughts on that? Bashira wa Nadira is in the Quran. It's understood good, but like, in, why isn't it mentioned here? This is one of Think of first revelation. Think of the time period. There was no belief. It's not about acting. There's no belief. Everyone was an idol worshiper. There's no one to give glad, glad tidings to. Imagine the first command, give glad tidings to who? So right now, the period, now you have to forsake all the idolatry, shirk, and everything going on around. That's why, most important thing, now start warning people. That's where it starts. So, and this is Anzir wa Rabbaka Fakabir is La ilaha illallah. Because La ilaha illallah starts with negation, so warn. And then Rabbaka Fakabir, then you affirm Allah. So there's so many insights into this verse. This is not a tafsir class. But now, you know, these are preliminary instructions that were given to the Prophet to prepare himself. And then Fahami al Wahi wa Tataba. Now, Revelation started to heat, heat up and it started coming quickly. So it's a great uh, portion of the hadith teaches us about that period of time where the revelation stopped and then it started coming again. Okay. 
And now, but now continue. It, it doesn't end here. There's one more line. So, how about yeah, finish it off for anybody? The last line. Okay, so this is important for Hadith students like Tataba'ahu Abdullah bin Yusuf. So now this is bringing an additional isnad. You have to learn how to construct the isnads from here. So taba'a means it's a supporting isnad. So in hadith sciences, mutaba'a. Mutaba'a is a supporting isnad. So often muhaddithin, they'll bring the primary isnad. So the primary isnad is in blue right here. And then the supporting isnad would be additional that come. So now taba'ahu Abdullah ibn Yusuf. So when you bring a supporting isnad, Bukhari is bringing from his own teacher. Okay. So who's his teacher? So what that means is Bukhari brings a supporting isnad for the teacher, for his primary teacher. Who's his primary teacher? Yahya ibn Bukair. So the primary isnad, that's Bukhari down here. Bukhari is relating from Yahya ibn Bukair. When he says, Taba'ahu Abdullah bin Yusuf, he says, my other teachers, two other teachers supported the same isnad. So he got the same isnad from two other teachers other than Yahya. So Abdullah bin Yusuf at Tinisi, the one who's hadith number two, and Abu Saleh. So Abu Saleh, and they're both relating from Laith. And then from Zuhri, from Urwa, from Aisha. So he just brings an additional isnad at the end, and it's called Mutaba'a, a supporting isnad for the same hadith. So it's not that significant and essential if it's hard to follow, it's not that important, but for advanced students, you need to know this. So. Abdullah bin Yusuf, we already talked about him. Um, Abu Saleh was Egyptian. He was a scribe of Laith ibn Sa'ad. Laith ibn Sa'ad, the great Imam of Egypt, contemporary of Imam Malik, and rival of Imam Malik. So Abu Saleh, Abdullah ibn Saleh was his full name. He was a scribe of Laith ibn Sa'ad. He wasn't as strong as a teacher, but because he was a scribe and he spent so much time with Laith, reports of Laith, often Bukhari uses him as support but not as primary. So Bukhari uses him in the Mu'allaqat. So, um, so this is Taba'ahu Abdullah bin Yusuf Abu Saleh. So now you have all these isnads here. Primary isnad is this, that's the strong isnad. Then you have Abdullah bin Yusuf from Laith, from Zuhri, from Urwa. Abu Saleh from Laith, from Zuhri, from Urwa. Same hadith. And then he says something else. What's the next line? Taba'ahu. What's the name? Hilal ibn Raddad. And then what does it say after that? You have to read the whole thing. An is Zuhri. So now there's another supporting isnad. Now a third one. Hilal ibn Raddad. So, and that says An is Zuhri. So where would Hilal ibn Raddad come? Here. So that's much higher up. Hilal ibn Raddad. It's not a teacher of Bukhari, but Hilal ibn Raddad through a chain also relates um, the same isnad but from Zuhri directly and going up the same isnad. So, and then there's, I think there's another line. Is there another line? Waqala Yunus. What else? I can't see it. Wa Ma'mar. Bawadiru. Okay, good. Yunus and Ma'mar. Okay. Also, Ma'mar is 
God's viewing us. Then you have Magma. Well, from Zuhi. It says, I'm in Zuhi. So we have three more people taking from Zuhi the same as Snub. Okay. So this is your complete Isnad chart of the second hadith. Why is this important? I'll explain to you why. It's very, very important. Because when you have supporting Isnads, that means they're not as strong as the primary Isnads. So supporting Isnads, so these aren't as strong as the primary Isnads. These people would not be on, so Hilal is not on Bukhari's condition. So that's why Bukhari doesn't even quote his teachers going to Hilal. So these are these isnads are mu'allaq isnads. So they're not only they're supporting isnad, they're the mu'allaqat of Bukhari. So mu'allaqat of Bukhari, sometimes they're in the chapter heading, sometimes they're in the end of the hadith. And you can see, so Hilal is not a teacher of Bukhari, he's higher up. He's a student of Zuhri from Malik's generation. And Yunus and Ma'mar. So Bukhari just quotes them coming from, Yun from Zuhri, but he doesn't quote his isnad going there. So that's what's mu'allaq. Like Bukhari is just quoting a partial isnad, but not his direct link to them. Like he's skipping his teachers. So these are mu'allaqat isnads. Um, so anyway, so there is a reason Bukhari does all this. And, you know, so, so Hilal ibn Raddad, for instance, he's not on the conditions of Bukhari. And he's not mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, except in this one line. So nowhere in Sayyid Bukhari you'll find Hilal ibn Raddad. So he's only mentioned in this one isnad. So when you have a case like that, when you have a teacher mentioned in one isnad and it's a mu'allaq isnad, that means it's not strong at all. Bukhari was not seem him, deem him fit to be included in any of the primary isnads. Um, so Hilal was a student of Zuhri. He collected all this hadith of Zuhri. Um, Trying to see how detailed I need to get. I just want to get to the point. I know it gets getting highly technical. Um, so Yunus and Mamar they mentioned Bawadiruhu. So he's just he's just quoting how so Yunus and Mamar when they quote this hadith, they have a difference in wording. So Yarjifu Fuaduhu, his heart was racing or his chest was racing. But in their version they have Bawadiruhu. Bawadiruhu means between your shoulder blades, the inside. So they use a slightly different word. So Bukhari just relates that there's a difference in wording from this version, which is not strong anyway, but it's just a supporting capacity. Okay. So why is this so important? This is important for following reason because actually, So remember we mentioned Zuhri sometimes does things. Zuhri adds his own comments. And so, so Zuhri here at the end of the hadith, he's adding another teacher and bringing you another portion of a hadith, of the same hadith. So Zuhri is notorious for doing that. For that reason, a lot of people were questionable about him. So Imam Malik scrutinized his reports and only accepted those he was certain. So there's an example of a hadith of Zuhri that's also related in Sahih Bukhari that causes a lot of confusion. So let me share with you the hadith itself. Any preliminary questions for now? Also, the same hadith is it in Tabar Mutaba? Yeah. Yes. Um, no. Like no, in Ahmad and Muslim, so that we don't know. You would have to look up the original sources. Some of the other books, they might use this as a primary snad and not mutabar. So, um, 
I'm just trying to search for the hadith. So there's a famous hadith that are quoted in, in these online debates. Um, how many people heard of the hadith where the prophet wanted to commit suicide? So there's a, there's a hadith there, and it's in Sahih Bukhari. So where the Prophet well, I'll show you, show, show you the hadith, but why does it matter? So many people quote that your Prophet wanted to kill himself. So he can't be a Prophet. So they're using that right and left. So, um, so we need to understand. So you read this hadith about the beginning of Revelation and the Fatratul Wahi right now in Sahih Bukhari. Do you find any of that here? No. You don't find that here. So that's not in this report. So where is it found? So here is the hadith. Um, how do I share? I guess I have to duplicate my slides. Duplicate screens, I mean. Actually, I don't want to duplicate. Hold on. I'll do I'll do something else. I'll make two windows. That way I can keep my screen open and control it. Show uh, yeah. Okay, that's the hadith. And can you see? Okay. And then online students, one moment I'll share it with you too. Okay. So if you look at this hadith, so let's look at the isnad. Yahya ibn Bukair, haddathana layth an uqail an ibn shihab, haddathani Abdullah bin Muhammad. So here is the same isnad, same primary isnad, but then he adds a second isnad, Abdullah bin Muhammad from Abdul Razak from Ma'mar from Zuhri. So you see the name Ma'mar. So this particular hadith comes from Ma'mar. Uh, it's, it's also the same primary isnad, so this is Zuhri's recalling of the beginning of Revelation. And it comes through a slightly different isnad. The same primary one, but Bukhari quotes Ma'mar's version here. So this is Ma'mar's version. And here, if you go to the hadith, it's pretty much the same about the Ghari Hira. But at the end, you'll find, oh, I got to forward it. Okay, it should be somewhere there. So, Wafatar al Wahi, do you see Wafatar al Wahi? Um, I can't see. Yeah, yeah, so it's here. Actually, I'll make it higher. So, there you go. So, in this version, so everything's the same. Wafatar al Wahi, remember in our version, the first hadith, wa fatar al wahi wa tataba, and the hadith ends. That's the strong part of the hadith. But here it kind of continues, wa fatar al wahi, which means wahi stopped. So here it says, wa fatar al wahi fatratan hatta hazina al nabiya sallallahu hazina al nabiyu sallallahu alayhi wa sallam fi ma balagana. So now it looks like there's something else going on here. So what does it mean? It means revelation stopped. <coughs> for a period of time until the Prophet ﷺ went through extreme sadness in what was reported to us. Fima balagana. So this is, balagana means what reached us. So Zuhri often does this where he creates his understanding of events and gives you his understanding and he references by saying it reached us. Like from everything that reached him, he's giving you like his conclusion, his understanding of this matter. So it's not like a strong first-hand witness, 
But uh, Zuhri is kind of summarizing. So this is something called Balagat Zuhri. But Zuhri often has these interjections. So what does he say? Continuing. Khuznan ghada minhu miraran kay yataradda min ru'usi shawahiq al-jibal fa kullama awfa bi dhirwat jablin likay yulqiya minhu nafsa tabadda lahu jibril fa qala ya muhammad innaka rasulullah haqqan so it means that the prophet sallam he was so uh, saddened right he was so saddened that every time he um he went to the tops of the mountains and started thinking about throwing himself off the mountains. And every time he was about to throw himself off, Jibreel came to him, appeared before him and said, Ya Muhammad, inna ka Rasulullah bi You are truthful, you are the messenger of Allah in truth. And then he would stop. Then he would go back up to try to throw himself off again and Jibreel would come and, and it happened several times. And then the hadith ends. Okay. Uh, with some more details. So here, so this is where the source of that information is. Well, Prophet ﷺ, if this is true, that he tried to throw himself off the mountain, it is in Sahih Bukhari, but where? In Kitab al-Ta'bir, towards the end, in the book of visions, of dreams. So Bukhari did relate this, relay this information, but if you put a, his whole work in perspective, put all the narrations together, this is not a strong narration. And it's absolutely not true. So it's totally false that the Prophet ﷺ would have done something like that. So there are many, many reasons. Um, so first of all, Ma'mar from Zuhri, that's where this is not is coming from. So only Ma'mar, the student of Zuhri, reported this version. Of, of, of the Prophet throwing himself, trying to throw himself off. So Ma'mar is not the strongest student of Zuhri. Stronger student of Zuhri is Laith, right? Laith and, you know, so that's the primary Isnad. So this is like a secondary tertiary Isnad. Ma'mar is not that strong. When you, when you share the versions or look at the versions of the story coming through Zuhri, only Ma'mar, the student of Zuhri, is relating this portion. So that's one problem. So when you have like a weaker student of Zuhri relating this portion, all the other strong students of Zuhri don't have this version or this is this extra edition that says Fima Balagana, where Zuhri himself admits from what reached us. That tells you this is weak because Muhammad is not strong. Um, and also Ibn Hajar talks about, or in, even other scholars like Sheikh Akram mentions that you know, it's inconceivable that the Prophet ﷺ would have contemplated something like that because there's so many moments in his life where he went through extreme sadness. Even Aisha asked him in Sahih al-Bukhari, Has there come to you a day that was harder than the day of Uhud? And, you know, he said yes. And he talked about the, his trip to Ta'if. In that trip, is there any mention of him going through feelings like this uh, is it worthy of the life of a messenger that he would want to throw himself off and also if jibri comes and says you are the messenger of allah with truth you see the angel with your own eyes in full daylight and he's saying you are a Allah. isn't that enough to convince you but then the report says he went back and tried to throw himself off. again it had to be told told to him three times that doesn't make sense so so from a hadith perspective, it is there in Bukhari, but it says this secondary isnad. If you know isnads and you know Zuhri and his work, you know that this is not a strong addition. It doesn't have direct isnad, this portion of the story. And it appears, so now why did Bukhari include it? That's a million dollar question. It appears that Bukhari did not include this purposely in the beginning of the book. Doesn't have this detail at all to show you this is the strong version of the story. And now in this particular portion, towards the end of the Sahih, he includes and includes this portion, perhaps to show you that it's weak. So this is Mamar's version. If it was a stronger version, he would have included it right in the beginning of the book that we're studying. So this is how you understand supporting Isnads and primaries. And that's why it's important. You have supporting Isnads. If you have information coming from that, often it's not that sound. 
So this story, so it's not the case that, you know, it's very important to understand anything appearing in the book called Sayyid Bukhari doesn't mean it's strong. Because Bukhari is using accessory, uh, accessory asnads and he's quoting portions of a hadith. So some portions are strong, the others aren't. And from his comments, he's including that portion, Fima Balagana, to show you that it's not connected to the Prophet. So it appears to be the case that he knows that this portion is not sound. And he included it just knowing that or expecting that you would know this. Now people misunderstand always oh, in Bukhari. They don't look at any of these nuances. They don't look at the isnads and they miss this information. Now, famously, people talk about this hadith being in Sahih Bukhari. Um, that's all I have for today. And I know there are a lot of questions. Let's pass the mic around. I know Ramjan has researched this hadith, so he can share some comments. Just um, the additional wording. Do we know that Zohri said that? No, we believe Zuhri said that because it's Fima Balagana, that's his quote. So when someone's quoting like what reached us, then it's an accurate quote of Zuhri. But the issue here is, remember the discussion between Layth ibn Sa'd and Malik, beautiful series of letters, like Zuhri was known to add things. Like all teachers, we add our explanations. So Zuhri did that fluidly in the course of teaching. So a lot of people weren't happy with that. So then it would mess up the hadith because some people weren't careful to know what's part of Zuhri's words and what are parts of the hadith. So, but here's the thing, here's the kicker. Layth ibn Sa'd is the strongest student of Zuhri. He reports this whole incident from Zuhri, but that's not in there. Look at all the versions of Layth coming from Zuhri. Of this hadith, it does not have that portion. Only Ma'mar, so he's not as careful as a student of Zuhri he probably didn't realize or unsuspecting he's not as careful so he included it innocently so but now unfortunately people read that and they go through mama or they go through lesser students that's why Bukhari really wants to go for the best students of each reporter a teacher because that makes a huge difference look at how big of a difference if this is true creates so many problems in the religion if the prophet actually went through this and I've, I've heard people quote, oh, you know, people are into mental health. I've heard people quote, well, even the prophet went through mental health issues and just to give a boost to mental health. But you need to understand your tradition and what, you know, this is not a strong hadith. What's the prophet said in this chapter? Oh, Allahu Alam, why he included that? It's about, so here, the context of Kitab al-Ta'abir, how revelation began and his dreams. So what he wanted to show you is the first part of the hadith, which is the first part of revelation was truthful dreams. That's what he wanted to use here. But then he just added the rest of the hadith there. It doesn't like add to that topic. So if you connect this hadith with the chapter heading, you know why Bukhari was reporting this hadith, it's because of the beginning portion, which is exactly the same as the primary snub. So that part is sound, but the second portion is not sound. Maybe because mama was a baby and they were in class. Yeah, but like, I think, I don't know if he would have made up Fima Balagana from Zohri, right? Um, I think Balagana also could mean, you know, that there were a lot of the Zohri that were not accurate. Yeah. Like, you know, like, Balagana was not accurate. Yeah. And this could just be one of the things, of the many things that were out there, even if it's an extreme. Uh -huh. Even if it's like, even if it's an extreme, yeah. it could still be something that was uh, spoken of in terms of, uh, the severity or the weight of what was uh, the Prophet ﷺ was was experiencing during you know during that fitr. You know, yeah, fitr. of course. So balagha, balagha. So so how is balagha different from hadathana? So that's these are the terms you need to start recognizing. When I when someone says hadathana, it means this person reported to me in a classroom. That's solid. Or samirtu, I heard this person say this. When you say Rubiyan has been narrated from, that's a little more vague, but it's still fairly strong. Balagha means information reached us. That's so vague. So that includes everything that was circulating in the time. So that's what Balagha are. Like this is the information that was out there, or some people are speaking about this. So what does it represent? Probably it's a reconstruction of someone's imagination of what 
the Prophet must have went through, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Someone's active imagination. And someone before Zuhri, and then Zuhri said it reached us, and he's just quoting that. Yeah, yeah. It could also be something strange, or something that was uh, embellished. Because balag, balag means that also. Balaga. Yeah, oh, okay, I see. Yeah, I see where you're going, yeah. It's something that is embellished by someone. You know. mm, I don't know. Yeah. Let me think about that. The balaga is rhetoric, right? It's like when you enhance and embellish speech, create points and rhetoric. So, but is that the meaning of female balaga now? Allah, I don't know. I have to think about that. Yes, Muslim boy. Going back to the, the Hadith 3 and the Sana of Abu uh, Salama from Hurri, mm -hmm. uh, it says, Akhbarani Abu Salama. Uh, so, is this also going to say that in the Allah? No. So, so because now you have the same primary snad, and then he says akhbarani. So it's just this is snad mutabaat, mutabaatama. That's the proper term. It's a full snad that supports his entire hadith. So there's another version from Jabir that gives you similar information. So he didn't quote all of it, but it's very similar. So he'll just add the snad. But this is the the other ones. This one is uh, Mu'alla. Abdullah bin Yusuf is a, is is a Bukhari's teacher. So these are not malakat, but these two are. So you have to know what malakat, you have to learn how to recognize them. No. I'll just follow up on that. Uh -huh. this is, uh, when, when he says, Taba'ahu, then Taba'ahu ma jabir, wa Taba'ahu ma jabir. No, so Taba'ahu, my teacher. So the whole hadith here is, Hadathana Yahya ibn Bukair. So you have to go to the beginning of the hadith, the first word. Hadathana Yahya ibn Bukair. Taba'ahu, Abdullah bin Yusuf, Sub corroborated Yahya bin Bukair with his own isnad. That's the who is going back to Yahya bin Bukair. No. But, but if the taba is, he wants to add a the support higher up, then the next line is the taba of Ani Zuhri. So now it says, this teacher, this other narrator added his supporting, like a partial supporting chain through Zuhri, directly jumping to Zuhri. Because he jumped, that's Mu'allah, because he didn't give you the whole isnad. No. Is Bukhari doing that? Yeah. No, no. So now Bukhari is adding his own isnads, like additional isnads. Not Yahya. Yahya is already there. Now he's adding Abdullah bin Yusuf. He learned the same hadith from Abdullah bin Yusuf from Laif from Zuhri. Same isnad, but just no Yahya bin Bukhari. So that's a separate isnad from a separate teacher. But because the same information and most of this not is the same. So like he got the same hadith from two several students of Laith. Oh no, I'm not like that. Um I'm in the first first um argument you have. Yeah, so yeah, so Bukhari speaking this whole all the words are coming out of Bukhari's pen or mouth. Um but where is he getting from? Qala Zuhri, he's quoting Zuhri directly. So, because he, he just, it's the same isnad, and he, he learned the hadith from somewhere else where Zuhri said something else with another isnad. But up until this point is the same, but now he's quoting Zuhri. Like, so he's picking and choosing from reports that he learned. So that's what Bukhari does. He, he selects, and sometimes won't quote the whole hadith, and another portion will quote a larger portion of the hadith. So he's not, it's not the case that every hadith he'll quote exactly beginning to end. But he'll take portions to prove certain points and give you lesser portions. Like here, he didn't include the suicide portion because it's not part of Yahya's. Yahya didn't relate it like that from Laith. But Muhammad is the only one that related it like that. So he, he put that towards the end. Yes. No, so it is in, uh, I think, Ibn Ishaq. So this nad is there, and it's in uh, some other books as well, yeah. So that suicide portion, the so-called suicide portion, comes through Mamar from Zuhri, but it's uh, also through some other isnads. So that means there was some what, circulating information, but those other isnads are so weak. If you look at, so it comes through Waqidi, for instance, and that's he's extremely unreliable uh, in this type of information. Waqidi, notoriously unreliable. So it's, it is in the Sita books. 
through other chains, but those chains are not worthy. The only strong chains are Zohri's, and if strong students don't have it, his weak student has it. So our conclusion is that portion is definitely weak. You know why Ibn Ishaq would do that? Ibn Ishaq was not a strong scholar. He was a collector. Yes. So he was, so the Malik did not like him. And um, so he, he was also from Adina. So the Hadith expert disparaged them. They're like, these are just collectors. They just take from everywhere. They're not scrutinizing their information. And that's the early Sayyidah reporters were kind of like that. Waqadi was notorious. Waqadi and, and Malik had a rivalry in Medina because of that. Waqadi is notoriously unreliable. Many of his isnads are fabricated and like extremely weak. There's a new Sira book in town everyone's talking about, right? So what was this? Mama? No, it's, no, it's uh, Maghazi of someone, Kitab al-Maghazi. So it's one of the early Hadith experts. Um, his, so his book is recently discovered. It wasn't, it wasn't around for hundreds of years, maybe even a thousand years. So it's recently discovered the manuscript and they're publishing and, and everyone's going mad trying to get it. So it's, it's Maghazi Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu from Musa ibn Uqba. Okay. No, Ismail ibn Uqba. So it's one of the earliest sources of, no, it's Musa, it's Musa ibn Uqba. And so he's Imam Malik's primary source for the Sira, Musa ibn Uqba. So he, he's earlier than Imam Malik, so he's from much higher generation. So his reports are all in the Muatta anyway. Imam Malik reports most, all his Sira comes through Musa ibn Uqba. So, but now Musa ibn Uqba had his own book, but it was lost. We only knew about it through Imam Malik and through other references. But now recently they discovered a complete manuscript and they pub published it in Arabic. And all these, some Orientalists, a lot of Muslim publishers jumping on, promising to translate it in English. So it's going to be an early book, pre-Imam Malik and Muatta, exclusively on the Sira. That'd be very interesting. It will add to the scholarship. The title is uh, Maghazi. Kitab al-Maghazi li Musa ibn Uqba. It's published by a publisher in, in, in Arabic, and it's going to be translated in English too, by several teams. So people are like, Translating it simultaneously, looks like. Last question. Is this in yeah. any of the other other books? Yeah. It's in other books. But, um, I have the sources somewhere. I think Musnad Ahmad might have it. And, you know. Yeah, so that's probably tying to the Kitab al Ta'abir. Let me see. So after the the Prophet stopping himself from jumping, so called supposedly, He's explaining the, the verse, Faliqul Isbahi. Where does that verse appear in the hadith? Uh, yeah, so he, so that's not related to the suicide part, but that's going back to the beginning of the hadith. Beginning of the hadith is, the first part of revelation was truthful dream. Ru'ya sadiqa, finnom. And then whatever the Prophet saw in his night, in the day he saw it, faliq al-isbah, or faliq al-subh, with like the clearest daylight. So then Ibn Abbas, is saying when the Quran uses the term clear as daylight, Faliqul Isba or the bringer of daylight, it means the light of the sun uh, in the daylight. Wadawul Qamari Bilayl in the light of the moon at night. So he's just explaining the first portion. Yeah. Any sisters? Anyone online have a question? Okay, alhamdulillah, we finished this hadith, and tomorrow we'll try to do two hadith, so we can try to finish by next week.
فتح الله عليكم والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته